As we begin today, I want to ask a question, and I want you to respond. I want a little bit of dialogue back and forth today, if you're comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable with that, it'll happen anyway, all right? So here's the question. Um, the world today, unified or divided? You tell me. The world today, unified or divided? You tell me. It's divided. It's divided. How do, how do we divide ourselves? Can somebody give me an example of one of the ways in which humans tend to divide themselves? Yes. Race. We tend to divide ourselves by race. We like to say, uh, you, are, uh, you are Caucasian, or you are uh, African American, or you are Native American, and we like to divide by race. Now, the Bible does talk about different cultures of the world, and it celebrates each and every one of the cultural elements. We talk about that in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Bible says in the eternal kingdom of heaven, the kings will bring in their wares into the eternal kingdom of heaven, into the city of New Jerusalem, and there'll be a celebration of cultural differences, but not a division of race. You're exactly right. Why do we do this to ourselves? Why? What's another way in which we divide ourselves? What's that? Religion, that's right, religion. Uh, this is your belief of God, and this is my belief of God, or these are my gods, and these are your gods. We divide ourselves, we divide ourselves. Very good, somebody else? Political parties, political parties. Political parties. You are a Democrat, and you are a Republican, and I'm a Libertarian, and you're this, and you're that, and we're this and that, and we like to divide ourselves into little categories. And then we label those categories, and we clearly know that our label is far superior than your label. And this is what makes me a better human being than you, you are. What's another way we divide ourselves? Somebody else? Sports. What's that? Sports, yes. Have you ever been to Alabama? Anybody ever been to Alabama? If you're ever in the fall in Alabama, go into a store and you'll watch. Either everybody is wearing crimson red or dark orange because they're either an Auburn fan or an Alabama fan. And it is not a joke. It, I was in preaching in Alabama after those teams played each other. That Saturday, I said to the pastor, I said, hey, I should make a few jokes about the Auburn-Alabama game, right? Because everybody knows about that. And he said, do not joke about that. <laughs> he, he was serious. He said, don't joke about that in our church. I'm like, you gotta be kidding, right? Like, yeah. He said, there are serious rivalries. I'm very angry about this. And why do we do this to ourselves? Why do we do this to ourselves? Somebody else, another way we divide ourselves. What? COVID. COVID. Yeah, sure. You wear a mask and I don't wear a mask. And, and you got the vaccine and I didn't get the vaccine. And, and, uh, and everybody needs to think exactly the same way that I do about these scenarios. Uh, we divide ourselves. This is ridiculous. We divide ourselves over a massive pandemic that has swept the entire world. And so this is what we do. Why do we do this to ourselves? Because we're self-destructive. And, and, and this is not a good thing as humans. So if you're God, what do you do? M maybe, maybe from your perspective, the idea is maybe God wants us to be divided. Maybe as God, the father of all humanity, Maybe his plan and his goal is that all of his children are constantly fighting and angry, bitter, to the point where they kill each other and create wars. Do you think this is what God wants, yes or no? No, so what are we going to do? If mankind continually divides itself from one another, if mankind is constantly divisive against each other, from God's perspective, what is God going to do to unify mankind? And what is God going to do to unify mankind back to himself? It's a great question. Some of you already think you know the answer. The answer is if everybody believed exactly what I believe about everything, then everybody would be unified. Well, the answer to the Bible, the Bible answer to the question of how does God unify all of mankind is not get everybody to believe what that guy believes. But he does have a plan. And that's what leads us to the second sermon in the sermon series, Clue, Understanding the Mystery of Grace. In the first sermon, we said, to understand the mystery of grace as we make our way through Ephesians chapter 2 and 3, we need to understand the visual of the chair, that salvation can be understood through the metaphor of this chair. You see, as I look at this chair, we understand that by God's grace, he gave us salvation, and by faith, we must accept his gift of salvation. That was last week's sermon. Last week's sermon is salvation comes by God's free gift of grace through our faith that we put in that gift, the chair. Today, we look at the second clue, and that is the goat. So, introducing the goat today is a 
native goat lover here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, somebody I know very well because she lives in the same house. Her name is Heather. Give Heather a round of applause. And this, this is lipstick, actually. Hello, lipstick. How you doing there? I'm not going to touch lipstick because I don't know what she's going to do. Yeah, how, how, she's a little nervous, isn't she? And she is snuggled right in to Heather. How many of you understand that this is the best Mother's Day gift pastor could have given his wife? <laughs> All right, so for lipstick's sake, we'll go ahead and just keep this part of the sermon brief. This is lipstick. Why are we talking about a goat here today? And here's why, here's why. Because the goat symbolizes God's plan to unify mankind. The goat symbolizes God's plan to unify mankind to himself in a quite literal way. In fact, as you study throughout the entirety of the Old Testament scripture, you're going to see this. That Israel was a nation of shepherds. Israel was a nation holding these goats, sheep, goats. It's what they did for a living. And when they escaped the land of Egypt in the book of Exodus, the Bible says they wandered in the wilderness and God gave them a specific plan. The plan that he gave them was called the Day of Atonement. Say that with me. Day of Atonement. Now, what was the Day of Atonement? The Day of Atonement was the moment where God gave Israel an opportunity to reconcile themselves back to God and bring unity among the people. You see, even though the nation of Israel was one nation, they were constantly fighting with each other. And even though the nation of Israel was supposed to be the people of God, they were constantly in disobedience to God. And so God gave them a special holy day, a holiday called the Day of Atonement, where the family of the Israelites were to bring before the priests two goats, just about this size. Perfect goats, beautiful goats without spot, beautiful goats without blemish, the best of the best of the entirety of the nation of Israel. And in this Day of Atonement, they had two of these goats. The first one, this part is sad, especially when you look, at, look into the eyes of the goat, ladies and gentlemen. You're not going to like this part. The first one, God wanted to be sacrificed, killed. The symbolism of the first goat being killed or slaughtered taught the nation of Israel this point, that sin requires a sacrifice. The sin of disunity, the sin of fighting your brothers, the sin of disobeying God, the sin desires or the sin demands that a blood sacrifice must be made. That was the first goat. There were two goats that were brought at the Day of Atonement. The first one was the blood sacrifice goat. The second one was called the scapegoat. Have you heard that word before? It's scapegoat? Say scapegoat. The scapegoat was not sacrificed. This, the first goat represented the fact that the blood, or excuse me, that sin needed to be paid for. The second goat represented the fact that sin needed to be purged. The blood of the first goat paid for the sins of Israel, symbolically. The escape of the second goat purged the sins of Israel out of the camp. What did they do? They took the first goat and they killed it. They took the second goat, and the Bible says that the high priest would place his hands on the head of the goat. And as, it, oh my goodness, did it just talk? <laughs> did y'all hear that? I, I don't know what to do. That's never happened to me before. <laughs> Imagine being a priest in the Old Testament day. You'd hear a lot of that, I think. He would take his hands and place it on the head of the goat, and the Bible says, thereby transferring the sins of Israel onto the goat, and that goat would then be the scapegoat for Israel and would escape out of the camp and take the sins of Israel away from the nation of Israel. The first goat taught this principle, sin needs a sacrifice. The second goat taught that sin needs to be purged out of Israel. Let's give Heather and Lipstick a round of applause. 
Pastor Josh, why do we need to know all of this? Get this point. Because in order for mankind in Israel, in order for Israel to have peace among themselves and for Israel to have peace with their God, Israel had to sacrifice a goat and had to allow another goat to escape. The sacrifice purified and unified the people of God. Let me say that again. The sacrifice purified and unified the people of God. What does this have to do with Christianity? Well, now we arrive in the book of, Eph- the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. A quick word about Ephesus that will come in handy a little later in the sermon. Ephesus was a, multipo- uh, mul- uh, a multicultural metropolitan city. In fact, in this city that was massive, I mean absolutely huge for days of antiquity, we're talking about a half a million people who lived in this city. Let me show you a map of where this place would have found and why it was so multicultural. If you look at this map, you can see the Mediterranean Sea, and a little bit north, you're going to see Greece and Italy coming down there. And then as you see in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, that was originally called Asia Minor. And on the coast of modern-day Turkey, or Asia Minor, is the land of Ephesus. The reason it was such a big city is because it was a very famous port. And the reason it was so multicultural, it's because many people from around the world moved to that city. Now, this reminds me that the city of Ephesus would have been very much like the city of Las Vegas. Though we are not a port, we are a place of great entertainment, a large city where people from all over the world come. And when people from all over the world come here, we begin to see our unity and that we all want to live in the same city, but we also see great uh, diversity in where we come from, diversity in what we eat. Diversity in how we dress, diversity in how we live, diversity in what languages we know, diversity in our entirety, even the way we think, even the way we vote, even in the way we follow the precepts of God, and we see in Ephesus was very, very similar. Not only was it very multicultural because of where it was, uh, the city of Ephesus was very, very religious, just like Las Vegas. Now you say, come on, Las Vegas isn't very religious, but it's actually true. Las Vegas is one of, the most, um, uh, one of the most religious cities. If you actually look per capita, we're one of, the, uh, one of the cities that have more houses of worship per capita than almost any city in the United States. We're in the top 10 uh, places where more houses of worship are in the entire United States, which is amazing to me. We not only have a, pl- a plurality and multiplicity of all sorts of religion here, we also have the major religion, and that is the religion of worship of sex and of money. And so it was in the land of Ephesus. Major temples. One, for example, the temple of Artemis or the temple of Diana. Here's the way the temple of Diana looks today. You can actually go and visit it in Ephesus and see the ruins today. It's actually there. This is the way it would have looked back in the day. Uh, Go to the next slide. This temple was considered one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It is absolutely massive. It is gigantic, right, al- right alongside of the ancient wonders of the world, like the pyramids down in Egypt or the uh, hanging gardens of Babylon. It was a massive, huge, and beautiful structure. And it was here that the Ephesians worshipped the goddess of Diana, the goddess of war, the goddess of fertility and sex. Now, with all of that, we finally arrive at the moment in the sermon that you're going to grasp how all of these things come together. Ephesians chapter number 2 verse 13. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 13 is the essence of the entire passage. We're going to read it many times. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Do you see it? Do you see it? Let's look at it again. Look at what it says. But now, those who are in Christ Jesus... You who once were far off or far away from God have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Here the Bible tells us to all of the Ephesians, no matter who you are, those of you who are far away from God have been brought near to God by the blood of Jesus. Those of you who are far away from one another have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. 
What was God's plan to unify mankind to one another and unify mankind back to himself? Here was his plan. The death of Jesus Christ, where the sins of the entire world were transferred to the head of Jesus, and his death not only paid for our sins, his death purged our sins. All of that is known at this point. Now the Apostle Paul is going to relate it to the big problem they were having in Ephesus, and that is the church was divided. They were majorly divided over one issue. Half the church was Jewish in their descent, and half the church was Gentile in descent, and they didn't like each other. So we get to point number one. Segregation versus unity. Segregation versus unity. Look what the Bible says in verses 11 through 13. Therefore, the Apostle Paul says, therefore what? Therefore, he be, he's, he's connecting the previous passage. The previous passage, the Apostle Paul said, you were all saved by God's grace. Are you here today and you're saved by God's grace? If you are, say amen. amen. That means God has saved you not because of what you've done, but because of what God has done. Aren't you thankful for what God has done to save your soul? Amen. Okay, by faith. That means you put your faith in God's grace. You didn't save yourself. God saved you. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made by the flesh in its hands. He's talking primarily to the Gentile Christians in the room. Any Gentiles here today? That is, you're not from a Jewish lineage. Any Gentiles? I'm a Gentile in, in my lineage. My family comes from Lebanon, so that would be Persian. That would be Gentile, according to uh, uh, the Jewish tradition. Anybody here that is Gentile in their lineage, not Jewish in their lineage? Raise your hand. You say, I don't know if I'm a Gentile. If you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. Raise your hand if you're Gentile. Okay, a lot of us are. There are also Jewish people that is Jewish in lineage that come to Southern Hills and are part of our church. And, and, uh, and so here, obviously, way out here in Las Vegas, we would have a large Gentile community. Now, here the Bible says, he's speaking to the Gentiles, and he says, for those who don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about the uncircumcision. Now, why does he call them the uncircumcision? And why does he refer to the Jews as the circumcision? Here's why. Because, number one, the practicality that the Jews... The Jewish people, they, they circumcised their young born, and the Gentiles did not circumcise their young born. That's the way it worked back then. Now, they didn't just have this practice that distinguished them from one another. They actually began to call themselves that. They began to call each other that, I should say. So the Jewish people began to refer to the Gentiles in the church as, oh, you're, you're the uncircumcision. And the Gentiles didn't know what to do with that, so they began to label the Jews as, fine, then you're the circumcision. And so isn't this, by the way, exactly what humans love to do? We like to identify what distinguishes me from you, not based on what we agree upon, but based on how we differ. And then we like to label the other people, right? Oh, you're, I know what you are, you're the circumcision. And oh, you're the uncircumcision. So now you have the group of this church filled with people. Some of them are the circumcision and some of them are the uncircumcision. It's a weird way to define everybody, isn't it? And so he goes on. That the time you were without Christ, that is, at time, before you came to know Jesus Christ as Savior, you didn't even know who Jesus was, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and promises. There was a time as a Gentile that you had no part of God's people. It was God who gave Israel the scriptures. It was God who gave Israel the Messiah. It was God who gave Israel all of the way to heaven. And we as Gentiles were not part of that commonwealth. We were not part of that inheritance. We were complete alien. That means foreigners. That means illegal alien would be the concept that we would have for today. That we were not allowed to be part of God's people. Commonwealth and strangers from the covenants of God having no hope without God in the world. He says to the Gentiles, before you met the Jewish people and before you met the Jewish Messiah, you had no hope. How did the Jewish community in Ephesus view the Gentiles? You have to think about it from their perspective. 
say, boy, I got to tell you, man, I got to tell you, racism and that kind of thing, I just don't stand for that. It's just terrible, terrible stuff. Well, we would all agree. Nobody's going to stand up and be like, racism is great. We look back in the past, and this is what they're dealing with. Really, it's a racial issue, a fight, not just merely about religion. Why is that the case? Well, see, you and I could travel back 2,000 years to the land of Ephesus and say, why are you all fighting about this? This is ridiculous. You all believe in Jesus? Relax. That's what we would say. That's what we want. But you all don't understand the thousands of years of mindsets that the Jewish people had about Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles to them? The Gentiles are the Egyptians who enslaved them. The Gentiles are the Persians who destroyed their temple. The Gentiles to the Jews were, were, were the Romans who came in and conquered their land. The Gentiles were the Philistines. Do you understand? The, the, David is their guy. And the Philistine, the, the giant Goliath, that's the Gentile. And now they're sitting in worship with the Philistines. They're sitting in worship with the Egyptians. They're sitting in worship with the Romans. And there is thousands of years of prejudice against them. Who were the Jews to the Gentiles? Well, to the normal Gentile, they were these incredibly zealous and zealot-like religious people who did all sorts of weird ceremonies, who ate weird dietary law things, who dressed differently than everybody else. Honestly, they were a little backward, a little strange, a little weird, a little hyper in their religious devotion. I mean, for goodness sake, they brutalized their children by, by circumcision. Understand what I just said. From the Gentile perspective, this is the way they would have viewed the Jews. Why do you do that to your children? The Gentiles would have thought. And the answer would have been, because we're better than you. You see? So the division in the church at Ephesus was palpable. Verse 13, verse 13. Look at verse 13. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's not saying that you were once far away from God. He's going to deal with that in a moment. He's talking to Gentiles. The Gentiles and the Jews who were once far away from each other are now brought near by the blood of Christ. See, this was the problem that God the Father saw. He looked down upon the world, and even in the church, it was divided. Jewish people versus Gentile people. And he reminds them of this truth. How was God going to bring all of these people together in one family? The answer is the blood of Jesus Christ. He had to kill the goat because sin demands a payment, and the payment needs to be purged out of the camp of Israel. Number one, we see this, segregation versus unity. Number two, we see this, war versus peace. Say that with me, war versus peace. Look at what it says in verse 14, for he himself is our peace, talking of Jesus Christ. Do you know the way to avoid wars? Mankind does. It's one of the most practical things man has done for many, many, many generations. Do you know how to avoid wars? You build walls. You separate yourselves from those that are different than you. Now, some in this room are so politically aware because you spend six to seven hours a week on, or a day on, on media, you think I'm talking about a modern situation or a modern problem. I'm not. The only way from a human perspective to avoid a war is to wall yourself off continually from anybody who is different than you. Build a wall, build a wall, build walls, build walls. It's all over the world, historically, constantly, what humans have done to avoid wars. We don't only do it politically and geographically, we also do it within our religious context, and that's what the Apostle Paul is about to address. During this day and age, there was a temple, many temples all over the world, but there was one specific temple in Jerusalem that the Apostle Paul was trained in. It was the temple of God. It was the temple in Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, we call it Herod's temple. It was the second temple refurbished by Herod. There were several distinct areas inside of this, inside of this temple. Now, if you look up here, I'll show you specifically. Go back to the last slide. 
you're going to see inside of this temple, there is what's called here the outside of the temple on the Temple Mount. You can visit this place even to this day with me if you go on one of our Israel trips. And you can go inside of what was re- used to be referred to as the Court of the Gentiles. What do you think that means? It means... As Israel began to open its borders and people began to come into Israel's area, there were Gentiles who were not part of God's plan at this point, who were allowed to approach God, but only approach God so close. You could only get so close to God. Here is the actual temple, the holy place, and back here in the very back was called the Holy of Holies. The Gentiles were told, you're allowed to get this close to God, but you are not allowed to get this close to God. Why? Because you're Gentiles. And so what did they do? They erected walls to distinguish who was allowed to get close to God. They did this in the closer inner court. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Once you zoom in a little bit, you'll see that there were not only walls to keep the Gentiles out of the temple area, there were walls to keep the women or the female Jews away from what was really going on in the temple. So if you're a Gentile, you could be out here. If you were Jewish and a woman, you could be in the women's court. That's it. Why can't I go closer to God? Because you're a woman. One of the things that was not brought up is how we, as humans, like to uh, um, divide ourselves in gender. Women, men. Men are better, now women are better. Women are better, now men are better. It's constant division. In Christ, the Bible says there is no male, there is no female, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there's no slave, there's no bond, there's no freeman. We're all the same in Christ, but nonetheless, this is what we do as humans. And we erect walls to keep people away. In here, you could go in here if you were a male Jew, but if you were not a very religious male Jew, a priest of a certain family, you could not go into the temple right here. The holy place. So even the Male Jews were not able to go into the temple except you're a priest. And even the priests were not allowed to go inside of the last wall beyond what was called the curtain or the veil, which is almost a wall. You could not go into the Holy of Holies except for once a year if you were the high priest and you were only allowed to go there on the Day of Atonement to take the blood of the goat and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant. It was wall after wall, after wall, after wall, after wall that divided man from God. Wall after wall that divided man from one another. And this is why we see in verse 14 and 15 what the gospel does. Look at what it says in verse 14 and 15. For he himself, that's Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made both one. Both Jew and Gentile are no longer separate. They are now one in Christ. And hath, what does it say? What does it say? And has broken down the middle wall of separation. Jesus' death was all about breaking these walls down. No longer do you have to go through all of these walls and ceremonies to get to God. All you needed to do is be in Christ and you were with God. These walls were beginning to vanish. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two. The Bible says, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, in the flesh of the one who was sacrificed, in the flesh of the one who the Father placed all the sins on the head of that lamb, and he took the sin outside of the camp, in the flesh of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, He destroyed the enmity, that is the division, the fighting of mankind with itself. His death was intended to not only unify God and unify man and bring them together, his death was intended to unify man with man and bring us together. That's what the death of Jesus Christ was supposed to do. More on that in a moment. Now, Pastor Josh, when it says, go back to the last verse, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, what does that mean? It means no longer are we, listen now, hear me, no longer are we divided, no longer are we two, Jewish and Gentile, thus making peace. You say, okay, well, Pastor Josh, let me understand this. 
So did the Jewish people become Gentile or did the Gentile people join the Jewish family? And the answer is neither. Say, if you were at a wedding, and at a wedding, it's like a marriage, and you saw the man marry a woman and the woman marry the man, is she joining his family or is he joining her family? Now, it depends on what your cultural background is. In some cultures, she's joining his family. In some cultures, he's joining her family. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says they are both leaving their father and mother and cleaving unto each other. They're not joining each other's families as much as they are creating their own family. They were two, and they are now one. That's the best biblical analogy for this passage. What the Bible says the death of Jesus Christ did was it took two people groups and made them one people group. The death of Jesus Christ overturned what took place way back at the, ba- at the, uh, at the Tower of Babel. We are now one people group in Christ Jesus. This is a beautiful thing for us to know and for us to live. It means our identity now is in Christ, not in Adam. Hear this. Those of us who have been here the last couple weeks, you know this illustration. Hear this. The world sees itself because they are all the descendants of Adam. They are the family of Adam. Here is where they divide themselves constantly among every single different division they could possibly find to categorize myself and my family as better than everybody else. This is the way they do it. This is who they are, the family of Adam. They're constantly dividing. Those of us who are in Christ have one singular identity, and that is this identity. I am in Christ. That's it. This is so needed for American Christians to grasp. Who are you? Oh, me? I'm in Christ. But who are you? Well, I'm also, and we identify ourselves the way, the way the family of Adam identifies itself. Well, if you really want to know who I am, I'm a Republican. If you really want to know who I am, I'm a Filipino. Well, if you really want to know who I am, I'm my job. I'm my debt. I'm my income. I'm my career. I'm my family. I'm my lineage. I'm the color of my skin. Christian, listen, you are none of those things. You are in Christ. That's who you are. The world will never be united because as the family of Adam, all they see are the divisions of their own identity. It's called identity politics. And very, very, very well-connected, well-known, well famous people make their living making sure that people divide themselves from one another. Christ solved all of that by saying, you don't have to play those games. You are in Christ. And by the way, to ignore that truth is to make void the death of Jesus Christ, meaning it meant nothing. In the family of Adam, the Arabs will always fight the Jews, and the Jews will fight the Arabs. In the family of Adam, blacks will always fight whites. Whites will always fight blacks. Republicans will always hate Democrats. Democrats will always hate Republicans. In the family of Adam, the Japanese and the Chinese will always fight. But in the family of Christ, that is all in the past. We are unified in Christ. Do you understand? This is not negating the beauty of cultural differences that come together in one beautiful family. I love cultural differences. But what this world is dealing with now is the opposite of that. Verses 16 through 18, look at what it says. And that he made reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Don't you see what Jesus' death did? 
It's saying it put to death the fighting between not only man and man bringing them together, it put to death the enmity, the fighting between God and man bringing together. When Christ puts his arms out on that cross and dies, it is not simply because he was stretched out like a sacrificial animal, though he was. It symbolically shows that he as the high priest was bringing God and man together and bringing man and man back together. Verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. You see, something needed to happen in order to reconcile mankind to one another. Something needed to happen in order for mankind to be reconciled to God the Father. And the only answer God had for that is that the goat had to die and had to purge the sins of humanity. Look back at verse 13 again because it's the key to this entire part of the chapter. Do you see what it says in verse 13? What does it say in verse 13? It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Friend, do you understand what happened at the death of Jesus? Everything changed, everything changed. The problem is our world is living as if Jesus never died. Even worse, there are many Christians living as if Christ's sacrifice only means one thing, I don't have to go to hell. Christ's sacrifice did so much more than just save your wretched soul, friend. It changed everything. Number three, the first point today, segregation versus unity. The second point, war versus peace. Number three here today, one home, one family. One home, one family. Paul drives home this concept at the end of, of chapter two by expressing that now that we are part of Christ's family, we are one home, one family, in one household, the temple of God. Look what it says in verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the members of the household of God. There's nobody here that doesn't belong here if you are in Christ. In Christ, the Messiah was the one who reconciled all of us together in one family. You're not a foreigner. You're a fellow citizen with the saints and the members of the household of God. You are adopted. This is pointing back to chapter one. You are part of the family now in the family of God. It goes on. One family. Our identity is in Christ. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. That is, now that God has taken all of us little misfit miss pieces from all of these tribal backgrounds, from all of these tribal places, from all of these different life styles from all of these different places all over the world and have brought us to Ephesus or Las Vegas. Now God is taking all of you and he's building something new. And he's building this new thing on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself. What is he building? This is really cool. Look at what it says. It says he is building in verse 21 in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. What is God building on this foundation of prophets, apostles, and Jesus Christ? He's taking you and he's building a new building. What is the building that he's building? What is it? There it is, one person, very good. The temple of God, I'm gonna ask it again, say the temple of God. On the, on the basis of the prophets and the apostles and Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, God is building a new temple with all of these different parts, piecing it together to build a new building. What is the new building? The temple of God. The temple of God. In whom also you are built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Do you see what this is saying? that in the diversity of our backgrounds, God unifies us and puts us perfectly like a, like a jigsaw puzzle into a big, beautiful temple. And that's where God lives. Do you understand when Christians choose to be unified very differently than the way the family of Adam constantly is divided? we become the dwelling place of God. Paul tells the Corinthians, you individually are the temple of God, which is true. Two things can be true at the same time. 
Paul tells the Ephesians that when we come together in unity, we are the temple of God. Paul is saying to the Ephesians, you think that temple of Diana is something? That's nothing. Let me tell you about a temple that has a better foundation than ever has been laid. And let me tell you about how God has built it with all the different people groups around the world who are all now in Christ building this beautiful, unified, global temple where God actually dwells. Man, isn't that beautiful? So then, what does this mean for us? It means, friend, that we are to seek unity. Listen, listen. In the family of God, we are to seek peace. Hear me, hear me. It wasn't me, it was our Messiah, Master, who said on the hillside one day, blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are to pursue one family. This was the dream of God the Father. God the Father wanted unity among his family so much. Hear what I'm saying. He wanted the unification of, the fam- of, of his family so much. He, left, he sent his own son to die. You say, I thought Jesus Christ died for my personal sins. Yes, he died for your personal sins. John chapter 3 verse 16 makes that very clear. But it was not the only result of the death of Jesus. He accomplished more things than just your wretched soul gets to go to heaven and mine. He was unifying all things to himself. This was the dream of God the Father. In order to get peace with man, in order to bring peace among men, the Father had to sacrifice the Son. And it had been a symbol for Israel for 1,500 years in the, in the Day of Atonement where they brought goats and one goat was slaughtered for the sins of Israel to pay for the sins of Israel and the other goat was placed upon him the sins of Israel and it was purged out of the camp. That's why Ephesians chapter two and verse 13 is the key to the entire passage. But now those who are in Christ Jesus You who once were far away from each other, far away from God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Just as the goat had to atone for the sins of Israel, so Christ had to atone for our sins. And just as the goat had to go outside the camp to purge the land from their division and fighting, so Christ had to go outside the city of Jerusalem and die for the sins of mankind so that he could stop our division and fight fighting so the question is how will this sacrifice actually change the world you say pastor if Jesus was supposed to die upon the cross to unify mankind I guess he failed has he failed it's hard to say right you say I don't know I don't want to say he failed but look at the world Hear this and we'll close. There are two aspects to God's kingdom. The eventual and the right now. Eventually, in the eternal kingdom of heaven, all mankind who are in Christ will be united. Don't you look forward to heaven, amen? Where everybody believes exactly what I believe about everything. You'll be surprised and so will I. Hear me. It's not just eventual, the kingdom of heaven. Hear me, there is the immediate aspect of the kingdom of heaven, which means this, you are the kingdom of heaven on earth. You're an ambassador for that kingdom. Which means what Christ did upon his death upon the cross was to establish a new kingdom in the hearts of men and women, that's you, his followers. So if we look around the world and say it's not unified, there's only one place to point that finger at. us why have we as Christians not seen the essential nature of what the death of Christ was supposed to do and instead of falling into the divisive traps of the family of Adam and some of us even perpetuating the division we say we are one in Christ and all are invited to come in Christ and unify even now Who is it in your life, personally, that the death of Christ needs to bring healing with? Who is it in your life, socially, culturally, in society, 
that you see is so far different than you, who you need to reach out to in the love of Christ the way Christ reached out to others. If this was our understanding of the death of Christ, it would change everything. This is the mystery of grace. The chair, by God's grace, he gave it. By faith, we sit in it. The goat, without the shedding of his blood, there is no unity. Let us pray. Father, how often we, as the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, forget that we have now been saved out of that family and are now in the family of God. My prayer is that we would deeply study and know this passage and would be the arbiters of peace in our society as we reach out to our, those in this world who don't know Christ and bring them into the family and those who do know Christ and unify under the banner of who he is. Help us to be just that, to exemplify the gospel and the mystery of grace to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.